Today's reading is John chapter 8, verses 31 to 38. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we should be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence and you are doing what you have heard from your Father. Amen. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you John for the Bible reading and um, just a sneak preview coming up in two three weeks time we're actually going to go through the book of Philippians um, I'm excited for that for a couple of main reasons one is because uh, we it was foundational to the planting of our church 20 years ago it's a book that we went through then but in particular because the book is about joy and Paul writes to this church in the most dire of circumstances and says that no matter what their circumstances are they can choose joy and no joy and uh, that's going to be so appropriate for where we are at and where we're going uh, in our life and in our world so that's coming up which reminds me if you want to catch up on any of the other talks that we've had uh, you can go to suttonvineyard.com Org and everything is on there all our updates all our talks all our sunday materials kids youth also a bunch of reflections by me as we're going through the coronavirus crisis so if you want more of things that you're finding helpful there go to suttonvineyard.org now um this passage that we've had read today um highlights a gap that we have in life um, and I've realised coming into this situation that there are so many things I've always wanted to be as a Christian and I feel like the Lord challenged me and he said Jason if if you don't become those things now what on earth would it take for you to step into them and become them and, and by that I mean there are lots of things that I have glimpsed and tasted do you know there are experiences of of God that I have had and then moved away from because of business and life um, and and then I that got me thinking what if God was my first thought what if he was closer to me than I am to myself what if as I'm going through my Bible at the minute again and seeing the words of Jesus and going these are amazing what if this was true and I lived by it? what if he was my shepherd what if he was the light of my life what if he was the vine and the way and the truth what if I was more than a conqueror in Christ what if I knew what it was like to be engraved on the palms of God's hand as, as my father what if I knew that my inheritance that I had in heaven was a available to me that Jesus tells me about right now and what if my life was not about giving God the leftovers but if he was my everything the basis for everything what if I saw him and who I could be in him in this time and, my, and, and instead of some of the things that are rising up at me in this season that faith rose up and that power rose up and miracles rose up and what if the words of Jesus were true when he begins the gospels and Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand it's in the atmosphere it's closer to me than I am to myself it's closer to me than the atmosphere of COVID-19 the coronavirus and fears and worries and apprehensions the kingdom of God is there it's at hand all of this and more what if all of that was true is what I'm asking myself and as I come to this passage, it's what it reminds me of and Jesus prompts me about. How do you and I access all of those things I just talked about that Jesus says he has for us? Because if I'm honest, there's often a big gap between all of those things and where I'm at. And maybe we could hit the pause button now and you think about what, where, where are you in relationship to Jesus and all of those things? Is there, is there a gap? Because in this passage, and in particular one verse, John, uh, in verse 31 of John 8 here, Jesus shows us the one thing, and it is only one thing, that makes the difference 
between us not experiencing those things and those things coming into our lives. Now, Jesus knew something. Uh, He knew something that behavioral scientists have been finding out in recent years. Behavioral scientists are people that study human beings and look at them and how they behave and how they respond and what happens to them in life. Uh, And Jesus knew human nature long before scientists did. But these scientists have been discovering that there is a gap for every human being in the world between what they say they love and believe about and what they experience it's the experience of all human beings in life race whatever race creed color uh, ethnicity whatever you are and we stand on the threshold of that between what we would like to be and what could come into our lives and and what they've discovered is there are three phases that we go through the first one is that something gets our attention we see and hear something as oh that's interesting i wonder what that is and then we ponder it and wonder about it and explore it and think about it and question it and what happens is we start to wonder oh i understand this a bit now enough that then something happens we want that we want whatever it is the place or the experience or the opportunity and we start to desire it but then what happens is we often stop there so we've seen it thought about it want it and then we do absolutely nothing about it so i was trying to think of some examples you know some celebrity endorses something appears on facebook about some amazing new diet and we go oh that's interesting and we look at it and we explore it and then maybe we buy a book about it or watch some videos on it or buy a course on it and we do all of that and we go from seeing and hearing to understanding it a bit and then we love the idea i love the idea of this diet i love the idea of being slimmer and fitter and we imagine it and then do nothing about it or getting fit same thing you know we think about it we or our new jobs or new careers or new opportunities or a transformation of where we currently are and and we get our attention and we explore it and we love it and then we maybe even if we start doing something we stop and why does that happen and it especially happens in our relationship with jesus we see and hear about Jesus, we understand him and explore him a bit, maybe we, some of us have done that, and then we've maybe even come to love him. And we like the idea of following him, but we don't. And some of us can be Christians for days, weeks, months and years, and have seen Jesus, know something about him, even come to have some feelings for him, but then do absolutely nothing about it. And you know what? Behavioural scientists know that everything we want is in this human experience. They can describe it and in, in, in detail from all their surveys of people. That as people, we come to the threshold of something we want to be, that we see and we know and we understand and we could become something more of, and yet we don't press into it and we don't do that. And they know there is one thing, only one thing. And by the way, we're going to see how Jesus knew this. 2000 years ago long before scientists discovered this and that one thing is this to take action to commit to do something to be moved towards making changes with our lives and to do that when we don't feel the love anymore or the interest anymore so again i was thinking this imagine if you only went to work when you felt like it I'm not sure how many of us would make it there. If only we went to work when we weren't tired. Imagine if you were only a parent when you felt like it and weren't tired. That wouldn't work out. That doesn't work out, does it? We know that. But the same thing for all of life, and especially in our relationship with Jesus, we have this gap. We see and hear all these amazing things, and we love the idea of it, but we never take action. Or if we do, we quickly stop. And as I said, Jesus knows this, and that's what verse 31 is about, John 8, 31. Jesus said that if you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So never mind, I mean, the behavioral scientist thing is just to say this, Jesus isn't making this stuff up. He knows people, really, because his father knows people. So what does hold onto 
the, his teaching mean? Well, literally, in the Greek language, it actually is the word that means abide. And abide means to live in, to live out of, and to be faithful to. A very rich word. And that's interesting, because if we go to John 15, verse 4, Jesus uh, talks a little bit later in John. He says, if, if you abide in me, and I abide, and I abide in you. Abide in me, and I in you. John 15, verse 4, um, is amazing. Jesus says, he wants to abide in us as we abide in him abide means to again accept and believe and act in accordance with that's what abiding is and holding to most of us wouldn't use it i don't hold to that belief sounds kind of archaic as it's often translated in english but to hold to to believe and take hold of so i've got a question here how do we hold to god how do we abide and take action in him and there are some things that that's not and jesus in the rest of the gospels is is it pains because human beings seem to think there are ways to take action with god and 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 this is and jesus says no it's none of these things and jesus uh, tells us in the rest of the gospels it's not about do's and don'ts that here are the right things to do here are the wrong things to do um some moralizing jesus told the pharisees and the sadducees off on a regular basis because they thought if i just keep the rules then i qualify and jesus says no you're never going to qualify that way or some of us think god is a cosmic slot machine he's if i do this and this and act in this way then this should happen in my life and some of you are finding that out right now in life you have been at, you maybe have even said to yourself but god i did this i thought that was the right thing to do and i prayed and i did all the right things so why is this happening to me and jesus says life doesn't work like that in relationships with god he's not a slot machine where we have guarantees of exactly what will happen if we do the right thing and another thing that we might be finding out is that some of us bargain with god God, if you do this, then I will do this. And Jesus says that's not what he's like. It's not what our Heavenly Father is like. But what Jesus is saying here in John 31 is that he is someone to love and pursue and take hold of and act over. And that abiding and holding to him makes us his disciple. And you may already know the word disciple is actually where we get the word discipline from. To be a disciple is to be disciplined and do something about what we believe and feel and love. And as I said, you and I know this is how all of life already works. And whether you want to get fit, train for a job, learn something new, whether you want to own and look after a house, you know, it doesn't matter how you feel about your house. It's got to be cleaned and looked after and repaired and a marriage needs maintenance and families need all of those things. So we know that so it's about first thing jesus says is this this action abiding in him taking action around believing and loving him but it also works the other way we've seen that in john 15 verse 4 so this discipleship with it with jesus uh, jesus says there's a freedom that comes from this um if we if we are his disciples um and um just before i get back to john 15 verse 4 let me ask you a question if we look at the things that we are already abiding in, the, the, we already abide in something. The only issue is what do we abide in and live out of? What has you? What fear at the moment? What pressure at the moment? What worries at the moment? Your circumstances? What's going on in your relationships and your work? And, and we know those things. They, they hold us. Sometimes they sustain us. But other times it feel like they drive us and we have to do things we don't want to do because they have hold of us. So this is the flip side of this. Jesus says to hold to him. But actually, Jesus uses, he says, if we, if we hold to him, he promises us something that we will be his disciples. He says, my disciples, possession, ownership, that if we love him and abide in him and live out of him something else happens the other way he can't he can't help it he responds out of love and he owns us and possesses us and he abides with us again john 15 verse 4 jesus says abide in me and i will abide in you and as i said we've already living and out of something or someone the only question is who and what are we going to live out of and and that's where some of us see and believe and we love the things about jesus but as long as no commitments required from him, because I've got my other commitments out over here around what I abide in. If we were to pause and ask Jesus right now, honestly, draw away from everyone and pray and say, Lord Jesus, what do I need 
to take hold of to abide in you? What do I need to let go of? What, what would you have me do to follow you? And he will tell you instantly if you pray that prayer. Many of us already know things that he's told us. We've got near and we've loved him and then we've drawn back because we don't want to do the things that love requires. John 2 verse 5, right at the beginning of the Gospel of John, is the story where Jesus turns water into wine. And there's, there's, there's a verse right at the beginning, and the servants who are there, and, they, and Jesus is there, and, um, and Mary says to the disciples, because Mary, Mary loves her son, and she knows Jesus, and she is seeing who's, who is emerging and being revealed to be, and she knows something about him. And she says to him this in John 2 verse 5, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. See, Mary knew in a relationship with Jesus, Jesus, that abiding in him and obedience and action was was the response because of a relationship with him. And there are others who came to Jesus, by the way. If we go through the gospel stories, several times we see when people had, they'd heard about Jesus and seen him and they had found out things about him and listened to his teaching. And then they get a one-to-one with him. They draw close to him because because they there's something about him that's captivated them and maybe they even start to like him and love him and and there's a theme in all those things they'll often say what do i need to do and jesus looks at every single one of those people one to one like he would look at us and he would say give up the other things that you abide in that your life is about and sustain you and instead come and follow me And a lot of people in those stories get to that threshold and they go, no, I don't want to do that. I'm not ready for that. Um, Jesus says, well, let the dead bury their dead. I mean, Jesus is pretty blunt. If I'm what everything that life is about. And you and I know that movies are full of that. Some have had the experience to fall in love and go, everything in life will take its order from this. I love you and I will give up everything for you. Well, Jesus loves us, loves us, gave up everything for us. And he asks us into that relationship that if we love him, we will follow him. Jesus is saying, become mine and I will be yours. Isn't that amazing? So acts of abiding. What do I mean by that? Well, again, let's go back to the behavioral scientists. They know that if we love something, we have to take action over it. Otherwise, we never experience it fully. And there's actually two things within taking action. So if you're saying, well, I get that. I want to abide in Jesus and I want him to abide in me and I want to take action. Let's get really practical. What do you do? And as I say, even scientists have observed this. And, and that gets us beyond knowing and feeling into experiencing. And the first one is to prioritise. Simple as that. Order your life around it. Commit to it. Take action. Put it in your diary. Give your time, energy and money to it. If you're in my church, you hear me talk about that all the time. Jesus, basically, everything is saying, if you love me, Give me it. Give me your time. Give me your energy. Give me your money. Take action now. Prioritize it. But the other thing that activates it is sharing, not keeping it to yourself. Tell others. Invite that. Say, look, come and see this. You see this in the story of the Gospels. People that meet Jesus and start to follow him say, come and see. Come and hear. Come and look at this to get their attention to start the process of drawing close to him. So tell others and share it with them. Now, How does that work in life? Never mind Jesus, because that's what happens in real life. So let's let's finish with this. We see this all the time, don't we? Online. People on Facebook, Instagram, social media are saying, look at this. And they're saying, take part in this. Think about this. Consider this. And then love this so that you will then buy this. Shamelessly. We, we do this every day, all the time, on things that we're scrolling through and looking at. Now, let's get really practical, okay? There are a whole bunch of guys in our church that go riding on bikes, like long distances, enormous amounts of discipline and effort, and they seem to love it. But more than that, some of them have more than one bike. I don't understand that. I've got, well, I do, because I've got one motorbike. I could imagine having more than one. Um, and they have a rooms, some of them, or garages or sheds, and they have bikes plural in them and and i've noticed over the years what happens is that they say to their friends 
look at my bikes and their friends look at them and their friends go oh that's interesting and they talk about the gearing and the carbon fiber and i don't know much about bikes and oh look at this and isn't that amazing and then something happens in those people they get drawn to it and they go oh i thought my bike was a good bike but this bike this bike is a really nice bike and then they say to their friends there's an act of discipleship what must i do and their friends say you must go to pearson's or whichever bike shop to get their bike and they spend a lot of money on their bike and try and tell their wives why that was the right thing to do and how valuable that was and you know what? it's almost like acts 2 verse 37 uh, peter stands up after Pente uh, pentecost and talks about who jesus is and what he's done and people have seen him and heard him and and he talks about having a relationship with him and in acts 2 verse 37 everyone was cut to the heart and it said they said to peter what shall we do in the face of any understanding we have about god and who jesus is and interest in him and a movement and any love and, and fascination with him like pentecost we might say what must i do and jesus would tell us like peter would repent give up all the other things that you abide in all the things that have hold of you and let jesus be the thing that sustains you and is your life lastly i want to finish with um a picture um as i've been praying for today it's been one of those things a bible passage and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a metaphor going around my mind and if i could be if it is prophetic i offer it to you and see if it presses into this so i just finished there talking about acts and and the upper room and i think there's a word for us an invitation for us our vision statement as a church is for god to invite us into our first and next encounter with him and god has an encounter for us everything that i've just shared is this amazing encounter that god has that whatever is overwhelming us we can be transplanted into him and be overwhelmed by him more than we are anything that's going on in life but there's a specific invitation again back to acts 2 jesus has prepared what's called the upper room now the upper room that the disciples met him um, at the last supper was not called the upper room because of anything that happened with jesus it was already an upper room they had upper rooms in the ancient near east and through the bible and jesus had prepared this upper room and told the disciples to go there for the last supper and it's quite likely that um, this upper room is where the disciples were after Jesus has risen from the dead, when they're hiding from, uh, and that was what I looked at with a few weeks ago in John 7. And it may possibly be that this upper room was also where Pentecost happened and the disciples were praying in Acts 1 and into Acts 2. So there are these upper rooms through the Bible and they occur. You go through the Old Testament, go into a Bible app and, and search for upper rooms. And upper rooms were places in buildings that were special places. They were smaller spaces. They were places of intimacy and belonging and privacy and commitment and relationship. And if you were invited into to an upper room or you had a meeting there and invited people to the upper room the reason you were there were because of relationship and belonging and commitment and and a sign of something special and the lower rooms in the building where people would gather and the ordinary things took place but to go to the upper room required a relationship and commitment now the upper rooms are also we see in the new testament are places where miracles occur um where people who are young uh, there are stories i haven't got time to go through them again today uh, people brought back to life and miracles take place in the upper rooms of intimacy and commitment and relationship with jesus so let's just um, i want to finish unpacking this metaphor i think there's an invitation that god's bringing us now and we see it here in john 31 to go from the lower room to the upper room now if you ask if you're if you ask a child what they want in life they will talk about lower room things if i can use the metaphor this way they'll say i want a new bike i want some ice cream i'm looking forward to a holiday i want some new clothes i want this game and those are all tangible things and they we, those are the lower room things they're the things that we can touch and experience and some of us are like that in our lives you know oh, i want my job to change i want more money in my bank i want to hug people i want uh you know i want to go on holiday and those are all tangible things but they're all lower room things if you ask a parent what they want for a child they will say very different things they won't say a new bike they'll go i want them to have meaning and purpose and identity and friendships and for who they are to come alive you see a good parent knows that and god knows that for us too 
So again, in this metaphor of the upper room and the invitation, this invitation to hold to Jesus, I imagine it like this, that there's everything's downstairs and crowded and everyone's talking about life and what's happening and Jesus is in the room and then Jesus goes up the stairs and he beckons you and he says, come with me. And you're like, what, me? Why? Yeah, you. I want to spend time with you. I want to share my life with you. I want to tell you what I think about you. I want to tell you that what I've got in store for your life. And you're like, but me? Come up to the upper room, to proximity and belonging and relationship and direction and abiding. And, and as I imagine that, and imagine it now for you, Jesus reaches out and wants to take hold of you and saying, come follow me. And everything in life that has hold of us, as maybe you imagine that picture, go, oh, Lord, I'm ready to abide in you. I want to abide in you. And Jesus says to you, good, because I want to abide in you more. You know, Philippians 3 verse 14, it's a lovely, uh, one of my favourite passages, we can get to Philippians in uh, uh, a couple of weeks' time. Paul says this, not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. I love that verse. And the press on here, Paul actually is about taking, he says to take hold of. It's actually the word wrapped, where we get the word rapture from, to seize. And Paul says, I am going to use every effort at my disposal to take hold of and seize Jesus because he has reached out to grab me. So, will you and I, in this season, where whatever is going on in your life, let Christ seize you and let go of all the other things that seize us so that we would take hold of him and abide in him and cross that gap and that threshold and experience all these things that Jesus has promised us. Amen.